Welcome to Shovel Talk, a podcast for economic developers, from your friends at the Golden Shovel Agency. Hello, and welcome to another edition of Shovel Talk. Uh, we are excited to get into uh, episode three of Amanda's uh, Remote Worker series. But first, instead of where in the world is Amanda, we're going to change it up a little bit this episode, and we are going to have, we're going to play Where in the World Was Darren? All right, so some of you may know that uh, we recently um, adopted a new dog, and to get this dog, we had to make a, a trip down to the state of Georgia, and I know what you're thinking. Um, if you know where I'm located, which is the state of Minnesota, why aren't there any dogs in Minnesota? Well, uh, my wife and I have had Brittany Spaniels, or technically known as Britneys, if you want to be um, want to be technical here, for the last 20 years or so. So um, a few months ago, we had to put down our latest, uh, our latest Britney, you know, and we were kind of getting the pangs for a new one. And uh, pandemic dogs, not sure what, but there really are not a lot of Britneys available, especially um, as older dogs and, you know, in good health and everything like that. So we were able to find one through an organization that we've worked with before called American Brittany Rescue. And after several interviews, I'm saying maybe six or seven interviews, we actually had more interviews with uh, American Brittany Rescue for this dog than um, Golden Shovel had with a recent gatekeeper <laughs> representative that we hired that you'll learn about a little bit later at the end of this pod. Um, so anyway, we got chosen. And uh, we had to get down there to get it. And last weekend, we did a marathon drive from uh, St. Paul, Minnesota to the state of Georgia with a stop in between on the way down and the way back in Paducah, Kentucky. So we picked up uh, Lorelei, better known as Lala. And uh, so far, so good with this dog. So we're loving this new dog. I'm good to have another companion around the house. And uh, that is where I was in this world. We'll get back to where in the world is Amanda uh, during our next podcast. But right now, I'm going to transfer the pod back to Amanda, and she can introduce our newest guest. Thanks, Darren. I am so excited to introduce this next guest. Uh, actually, been someone I wanted to interview for quite a while. As everyone knows, I travel full time, and sometimes I use uh, travel companies that work with digital nomads and remote workers. And uh, I do share experiences with my clients. And a lot of times they ask like, what, you know, how do these travel companies work? You know, are they scouting new locations? What do they look for when they scout those locations to actually, you know, bring digital nomads and remote workers to. And so I, this next guest is actually someone who, who works for that company. It's called Hacker Paradise. And so I get to sit down with her and basically pick her brain about how, what that's like and how the trips are like and, and how they actually pick locations to go to and bring remote workers to. So without further ado, uh, this is my friend Taylor. So let's start out with, of course, where you're from and where you're based. So I am originally from Fort Worth, Texas. That is where I grew up. Um, but I'm currently a full-time digital nomad. I've been doing that for the last four years. So I don't have a home base currently. <laughs> I usually, I move around uh, every like four to six weeks or so. So tell us a little bit about your um, background and career. My love for travel started in, well, when I was really pretty young, but I studied abroad in college. I went to London and then that kind of led to an internship in London after I graduated. And that really changed the trajectory of where I was headed, I guess. <laughs> I don't think I knew exactly where I was going in college, but um, yeah, that just like created this love for working and being abroad because my six months in London was just like not long enough, but it was enough to give me the realization that I loved doing that. Mm -hmm. um, and so I did return back to the US after my internship and I worked for a study abroad company for about six years. And just through that experience, I just learned so much about different countries and the world and the people I worked with were just so cool. They all done so many cool things that it really just continued to fuel this desire in me to like work and live abroad um, and travel as much as I could. Yeah. So after working in study abroad, then I became a freelance online business manager. My background is really more in just like operations, logistics, organizing, you know, communication and things like that and project management. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of where my skill set lies. 
And then through that, I created my freelance business so that I could travel instead of just encouraging my students to travel. (laughs) And that is when I set off in 2018 and I started nomading and I started in New Zealand and moved around. And then I currently work for a company called Hacker Paradise and we organize trips for remote workers all around the world. And I'm a on-site trip facilitator. So I move around with a group about every month and connect them with the local community. And again, just sort of organize logistics and be their point of contact. What really made you say like, okay, I don't want to just travel here and there. Like I want to not have a home base and be completely nomadic making that switch. And how did you get started with that? Yeah, I feel like it was a long time coming. It was very scary though. Um, Mm -hmm. And for me, I'm a planner. So, you know, you definitely see people online who are like, I just quit my job and I moved overseas and I figured it out. And like, that was not me. That was not right. And I think that's what a lot of us see. And it's like, and, and they're, and we're like, you know, how, how do they do that? Like, I think people Mm -hmm. are questioning, you know, well, I can't just make that switch, you know, at the drop of a hat. Like, Mm -hmm. so it's cool. It's cool to hear that, you know, not everybody has to do it that way. (laughs) No, there's so many different ways to be a nomad. But yeah, for me, I think it was just, I, right. I got to spend that time overseas. I got to live in Mm -hmm. London for, you know, during my study abroad and then for my internship. And then I came back and my company only gave me like seven to 10 days of vacation. Like, I mean, Mm -hmm. I was there over a period of time, so it, it got extended, but I was just limited based on my job when I could actually travel because summer was the busiest time for us. I could only travel in winter. And I was just like, this is not how I want to live my life. Like I want to be able to go on. Like, I think at the time I really wanted to go to Asia and I'd heard that, you know, you could go for like three months and visit all these countries. And I was just like, I would love to do that. So I think that was just the idea of something I wanted to do and knew that I couldn't with my job. Mm -hmm. that kind of fueled that desire. And then I also knew of the working holiday visa for Mm -hmm. Australia and New Zealand. And it's a year long visa that you can get if you're under 30 years old and you can go and you can live and work there for up to 12 months. And I was turning 30. (laughs) And so I was like, Hmm, I guess it's like now or never. (laughs) And I knew I would regret it if I didn't do it. And so I I did a couple of things to test out if this was a lifestyle for me. So the first thing I did was I did a solo international trip. So I'd only ever done them with other people. And I was, I did a 10 day trip through um, Paris, Brussels, and Iceland. I tested it out and I was like, okay, yes, I can travel by myself. I love it. And yes, also 10 days. It's just for three countries. It's just insane. Like that's just not how I want to spend my life traveling. So it was also just really personal for me. I just knew that wasn't what I wanted. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of the beginning of the process. And so I applied for the visa. I got the visa. I figured out how I was going to make my income, which was becoming a freelancer. But I spent probably eight or nine months in prep mode and Mm -hmm. building up my business um, figuring out how I was going to live in New Zealand. So I ended up house sitting while I was there. Like that was something brand new to me that I'd never stumbled upon before, but just really giving myself the time to figure these things out before I ever left. So once I kind of get it all figured out, then I bought the flight and that was kind of it. Like I just, I never looked back, but I will say one thing I did tell myself was I, I gave myself permission to not like it after all of this work I had done, after all of this prep, I, there was a lot of pressure for me to go for at least a year and love it. And it'd be amazing. And it was, but I was afraid that I wasn't going to like it and then feel stuck and feel like I had to do it because I told everyone I was. So one of the things I did, I was like, you know what, you can do this for a few months. And if you hate it, you can go back home and start over. And it's not the end of the world. And I think that helps me enjoy my experience a lot more too. Definitely. It's so important to remember it is not definitely not the end of the world. If, um, if something doesn't work out, you know, but the fact that you put yourself out there, you tried it, you know, is, is amazing. So so tell us a little bit about the house sitting. How, how Mm -hmm. did that work? (laughs) So there's like this really fun house sitting community all over the world. It's mostly made up of expats, to be honest, but, um, and a lot of retirees, that was like one of the youngest ones. They all kind of took me under their wing. But 
basically people in a different country. So we'll say New Zealand, for example, they are leaving to go on vacation. Sometimes it's a work trip. Sometimes they might have like a country home or something. So they're leaving for an extended period of time, anywhere from a week to, you know, it could be up to like a few months and they typically have pets or plants or a pool Mm -hmm. or like just house things that need taken care of while they're gone. And so in exchange for my services, which was taking care of the animals in the house and stuff, I got free accommodation. So it was really like a win, win, win for everyone. The homeowners got peace of mind. It's also budget friendly for them. It was great for me because I got animal company and like, you know, nice house dwellings wherever I was going. Um, And it was also budget friendly for me. And then for the animals, it's usually a lot of animals. It's called house sitting. It's a lot of animals care involved. They didn't have to go to a kennel or doggy daycare or anything like that. So it was also a win for them. So it's really something that's built on a trust economy, Mm -hmm. which I found really fascinating. There's no money exchanged there. And so it's just this really cool community of people that, you know, are providing services and just, they do it because they love doing it. um, And not because, you know, it hasn't been corrupted, if you will, by any monetary exchange. Did you ever have any unique animals that you had to take care of? (laughs) Well, in New Zealand, I had lots of farms. So I had like chickens and sheep and um, lots of sheep. Um, (laughs) And then a few, a couple of horses, a cow, some doves. I don't know. I mostly just had to feed them. Like when I say take care of them, in my instance, I just had to feed them hay. And then, but it was like a lot of just like, farmer. no, 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 no. I guess rancher more so. Um, but yeah, it was mostly dogs and cats, mostly animals I was more familiar with. Uh, all right. Let's get into Hacker Paradise a little bit. So what yeah. does a typical trip look like with Hacker Paradise? And can you share a little bit about how Hacker Paradise works with, uh, with local businesses in the, in the locations? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so we started in 2014. We were actually the very first remote work and travel company that was created. And it was really this idea of bringing nomads together, building a community, because it can be a very solitary life Mm -hmm. and lifestyle, uh, moving around from place to place. People are coming in and out of your lives all the time. And the founders really just wanted to bring community together. And so that's how it started. But how it works is we scout out in different locations. So I said, we're all over the world. So currently I'm in Prague. So I'll just use Prague as an example. So we now have a scouting team and they do all the work sort of pre-trip. They find accommodation for our entire group. They find a co-working space. And then usually those two sort of businesses become kind of our local contacts there. And so then when I come in, I come in and I help with all the logistics. I get everything organized. Those are my contacts. And then our our participants arrive, right? And then they have no idea that any of this behind the scenes work happened to make this trip possible. But while we're on trip, we hold different events throughout the week. So working is obviously a huge part of being a remote worker. So we make sure they have a really good place to work. Also, we try to make sure their accommodation is kind of work-friendly as well in case the co-working doesn't isn't the best place for them. But then during the week, yeah, we hold events. So we do community building events like potluck and different social events, but we also do events, cultural events. So we might go on a weekend excursion or we might go to a local restaurant or, you know, sometimes we try to plan something fun, like, Hey, let's go bowling. Last Mm -hmm. week we went to a board game cafe here in Prague. That was sort of our social night out. So we try to find things in the community that we can do And especially as a large group, I think that's the hardest part is sometimes like this group here was only about 12 to 15, but some of our trips can be more like 25, 30 people. Mm -hmm. So trying to find activities that we can do and tours that we can do for the entire group. And how long do the trips usually last? Yeah, most of our trips are one month. Um, Although we have a few that are six to eight weeks as well. But even on those people usually come for one month at a time. So that's awesome. Really, you guys are really supporting local business with, you know, bringing in remote workers and getting them kind of immersed in the community and connected to the co-working spaces and the accommodations and all that. That's really neat. Yeah. It's a really, it's like the fun part of it all. Like, I think a lot of people travel 
not just to see places, right? Like, I mean, the architecture here in Prague is amazing and you have all this history and it's really cool. But what draws people back to places over and over again is the people that they meet, it's the activities that they get, get to do. The more connected they feel to a place, the more likely they are to recommend it to others or return in the future. And I know from, you know, being a participant on, on a couple of, of trips that, that you guys often return to the, you know, the same places. And, mm-hmm. um, and so you're really building relationships with those communities. And it's just so neat that a brand new, you know, brand new remote worker or digital nomad can walk into a place that they've actually never been, but you guys have been there. And so Mm -hmm. that it makes that connection for them. And they're able to have such a more meaningful experience in that place than they would have if they went on their own and had to figure out where, you know, where to go, what connections to make. It's, it's just really an amazing thing that that Hacker Paradise is doing. So it's very cool. So um, are there specific resources that you or Hacker Parties look for when you're choosing a location to live and work? Obviously the co-working spaces and whatnot, but is there, is there anything else that you guys are looking for? Yeah. So we have a list. Okay. Um, yeah. <laughs> I like lists. <laughs> yeah. Lists are good. Um, I'm not on the scouting team, so I don't know that I know exactly everything on the list, but mm-hmm. for the most part, I mean, prices are really important too, right? We have a budget. Mm -hmm. Our participants have like an expected amount that they're going to pay. So usually we price out co-working location and then housing and just see if like that even fits within our budget. Mm -hmm. So pricing of things is really important. So there's actually a couple of trips this year that we really wanted to run, but we just could not find housing in our budget. And so we weren't able to do that. We also, with whatever co-working space we select, we say that you won't be further than a 15 minute walk from that co-working right. space. So also have to look at like neighborhoods and see if there's even enough housing available within where that co-working space is. Mm-hmm. Now our housing has changed. Like we're very open to different types. So we've used um, shared apartments, we've done studios, we've done co-living spaces. So we're not, you know, it doesn't have to be one style. The only thing we say is that everyone will have their own room, but you might have being a shared apartment and that's totally fine. Those are probably the two biggest things that kind of make or break if a destination is going to work. And then outside of that, we just want it to be in a place where we'll go at the time of year where there's nicer weather. So there's not like rainy season or anything like that. It's usually more pleasant since we're only there for a short period of time. And then there's, there's plenty of activities to do. I mean, you know, you were in Khalifi, Kenya with us yeah. last year <laughs> and that, um, because of COVID that one got delayed a little bit. So that was our first time running that trip. We are going back this year, but I was really, you know, when I was doing my research, I was like, what are we going to do here? It looks like a really small town. I have no idea, but it ended up, there was so much to do, right? So sometimes you really have to give places a chance and explore them. So if we can get those first two pieces figured out, the making sure it has really good Wi-Fi as well. I mean, a lot of our remote workers these days, again, also because of COVID, there's definitely a, a changing landscape between remote workers who are entrepreneurs and freelancers and remote workers who are remote employees. And that mm-hmm. means they have so many more meetings than mm-hmm. maybe previous nomads mm-hmm. <laughs> did or remote worker travelers. And so having really good Wi-Fi is really, really important and having space to have calls. So we've even seen just in the last year, changing priorities with our participants and what we also need to look for. So I think that's another thing is just to be open-minded about like, okay, like 50% of our people have meetings all day long. So maybe we can't run events at lunchtime anymore. Maybe it's better to do our events more in the evening so that more people can actually attend. So there's a lot of um, flexibility that's required, but yes, I would say those are probably, if we're looking at our list of needs and wants, really good Wi-Fi, um, a co-working space that can fit all of our group housing within walking distance of the co-working space and then just being making sure we're in our in a neighborhood that is connected to the larger city even if we're not like right downtown right so like right here in Prague we're out a little bit in a little bit quieter neighborhood which we find that people generally prefer a bit more but we're only a 20 minute uh, or 15 minute metro ride into like old town area where we can have access to more of the like touristy things. Mm-hmm. 
actually going back to Khalifi, Kenya. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think one of the things that I hear, you know, as I've talked to clients about remote workers, attracting remote workers is that, you know, maybe they, they feel like they don't have enough to do in town. Mm-hmm. One thing about Khalifi, you know, as you mentioned, mm-hmm. it, it was like, what are we, what are we going to do here? That was a place where I didn't feel overwhelmed by having too much to do, which mm-hmm. was a positive too. Mm-hmm. They, it was like, they had just enough. And it was, it was just really neat how backpackers, the place we stayed had kind of put together those things we could do on the weekends, you know, or, or our days off or whatever, and had kind of, you know, put together a list of things to do. And, and they were little excursions and things that even locals kind of took us out to do. So, Mm -hmm. you know, thinking outside the box of like, what can you, you know, offer community, you know, as a community leader or as a, um, you know, a business owner, maybe in the tourism industry, whatever it might be of, you know, what can you kind of package and put together and that's going to entice people to want to be, you know, want to come to the area, be in the area. That's important to think of. It doesn't have to be the more traditional like activities and stuff you can really kind of think outside yeah. the box and put things together so I think that's a really good point too and you're if you're talking about tourists versus remote workers mm-hmm. it's very different right tourists mm-hmm. are there to be entertained like 24 mm-hmm. 7 right so you right. feel like you have to have all these things for them to do right, right. it has to be like Disney World okay right. well, remote <laughs> workers we have to work full jobs every day. Like we have so many responsibilities (laughs) that really during the week, it's hard to fit in too much. We might go, I think like here, some people start a little bit later because they work us hours. So they might go have breakfast somewhere and that's sort of their activity for the day, just to visit a different coffee shop and have breakfast. And then it's to start their work day. And most afternoons, honestly, we just go to the park and There's, I mean, there's lots of beer gardens here. So we'll just grab a beer and sit in the park and watch the sunset. That is a good enough activity, I think, for remote workers because we are also working full time. And then, like you said, on the weekends, that's really when we fill our more touristic needs Mm -hmm. and we go explore. We do this. We might even like this weekend, we took a train about an hour outside Prague to go visit this other town and see the churches that they have in that town and just walked around. That was all we did. And so I think this idea that it has to be spectacular and it has to be this huge thing is, is not true for remote workers because really like we're so tired from working that we can only do so much. Right. Right. (laughs) And and that, and that's why we go to places for a month at a time so that we can actually feel like we experienced a destination um, Mm -hmm. on top of our work schedules. What could communities do to be more attractive to remote workers or to companies like Hacker Paradise um, that help remote workers travel and, and experience the world? I think And I kind of touched on the very beginning, but I think Mm -hmm. it's just the community aspect. One of the great things about our co-working space here is they do like member lunches once a week where they just go out to a local restaurant and facilitate conversation really at the end of the day. Um, And they've also recommended places for us to visit around like restaurants to visit around town is really is just the community aspect. So whatever you can do to create networking events or meetups or have, actually, I really loved in our coffee shop near our housing in Playa, Playa del Carmen, Mexico, they had spaces for remote workers. And then they had like specific tables just for conversation, like no laptops, right? And that's also facilitates this community feel because it's a place where you can go and have conversation, or it's a place you can go and be productive and be focused. So I think it's, it's finding ways to bring community together. And even all the places we travel to, we always look to see, you know, are there meetups happening? Are there, you know, just like the board game cafe we went to last week, like it was just a place where we could go and enjoy time together and do something just a little different because really at the end of the day, it's all about community. So I think if you can create some of those smaller events and get people more involved, that is what attracts them because nobody wants to go to a new place and then just be alone for a month, if that makes sense. Right. Yeah. And that goes back to the differences, I think, with tourists and, and remote workers and digital mm-hmm. nomads, you know, is the tourists is like, go, go, go see as much as I can, where remote workers are more of like, I want to experience local life. I want to make connections mm-hmm. and have meaningful connections with people where mm-hmm. I am. So 
Yeah. yeah. That's I've point. even uh, done, this was in Vietnam, but I'm going to Madeira in Portugal next. And I've seen it on their activity list too, but local like dog shelters have like daily walks. And oh. so you can go and as a volunteer and just be one of the people that takes one of the shelter dogs on, they do like group walks, but you can, you know, be a participant in that. So even thinking about more volunteer opportunities, I think that's the hardest thing as a nomad that I really miss is so many of them. And it makes sense. I'm not knocking any of these organizations, but they need like a background check where they want you to commit to three months of volunteer or something like that. And I, I understand why that is, but if there are little things like this, that you can say, Hey, anybody can volunteer for this. And it's a, you know, it's a little bit of your time, but it makes a huge impact knowing what those opportunities are. Cause they can be really hard to find, especially if you're already doing all the other logistics of a destination. But that's the one thing I really miss is like being able to volunteer and the destinations I go, because it just seems like, because I'm only there for a short period of time, I get kind of rolled out of those options. And, and that's interesting. I, um, I think that that would almost be easier to go to than a social event, just because Mm -hmm. a social event, sometimes it can be a little nerve wracking if you're going like, okay, I have to go here and be social. Whereas a volunteer event, Mm -hmm. okay, I, I have, I'm going here to volunteer the social aspect will naturally come out of it. And so exactly. that's almost something you might get more participation out of a, a remote worker or, you know, somebody there by them, by themselves. That's, that's a great idea. I like that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so alongside managing a, a group of remote workers, mm-hmm. uh, which I know can be crazy. I was one of those remote workers. <laughs> so I know how. <laughs> You're also um, growing a travel business online. So can you share your journey, building that business, um, your, you know, your social media. I know you work specifically with YouTube quite a mm-hmm. bit. So share, share a little bit about that journey with us. Yeah. I never intended to start it. It just <laughs> happened organically and naturally. <laughs> um, so I mentioned at the top, I spent a year in New Zealand when I first started out and I just got so many questions from people about how did, how did I do that? And what is it like? And New Zealand is just so gorgeous. I was like, I just want to talk about this all the time. (laughs) And so I actually started blogging because travel blogging, you know, is, is big. And I was like, I could do this. And I quickly realized I hated blogging. Writing is not for me and I do much better speaking. And again, I wanted to show what I was doing, not just write about what I was doing. And so Then I had the idea to do YouTube videos and I don't know where this idea came from. I really don't remember getting started. I just remember going from like nothing to having it, but yeah, I just started, I actually, I just started creating those blogs posts I'd already written into videos. So I just started with content I already had. And from there it's just grown. So I've had my channel since 2019 and it's changed over the years. It's had different iterations, but it's traveling tailored. So basically I just take you on my travels. I give you tips about places I go. Currently I'm doing a lot of digital nomad city guides for all the destinations I'm going with Hacker Paradise. So I cover like what neighborhoods to live in, where you can actually get work done. What are Wi-Fi speeds like? What are activities you can do when you're not working? Um, what was arrival like at the airport? Things like that. Like questions you have as a nomad before you get to a place. So that's kind of my focus. And yeah, my goal is just to educate and inspire people to live their best work from anywhere lifestyle. So what would be your top takeaways from your experience to share maybe with others trying to grow a YouTube channel? you're trying to grow a YouTube channel, I think it takes patience. Mm -hmm. It takes consistency and being very open to learning throughout the process. It's really not something that you can go into it and say, you know, I know best, this is what's going to work because it's usually the thing that doesn't work. Usually the thing that works is you're like, you have to go figure out why you're like, wait, okay, let me dive into the analytics and be like, What about this attracted people? Maybe it's your thumbnail. Maybe it was the format of your video. Maybe it was the destination that you were. Maybe you just found really good keywords for that video. Like all of that goes into YouTube because it's essentially as a search engine. It's a video search engine at the end of the day. And so if you really want to grow your channel, you have to understand that and you have to be willing to create content that people want to watch and not necessarily what you always want to create. 
there is a balance there. A lot of times I just create what I want to create, but I try <laughs> to imagine as a user what I would want to know or what I would need to know. So I don't just do, you know, two minutes of flash mobs of all the places I've been and you can just be like, okay, look, like, right, there has to be something else to it, um, some sort of, I mean, some people use YouTube for entertainment and some people use it for education, right? Like right. there's so many different ways to use it. So I think you just have to decide your purpose and what you want to create and then stay in your lane a little bit and like really dive into it. And also know that YouTube takes time. So if you try one or two videos and it doesn't work out, mm -hmm. you really have to stick with it because the algorithm has to catch up with you. Um, your audience has to sort of catch up with you. And so you have to be very, very patient and when figuring out the next steps on the best way to grow it. <laughs> I think you nailed it on the city guides because as you were talking about what you say, you know, what you um, share in them, the arrival at the airport, uh, the neighborhoods to live in, I'm like, oh man, this is exactly what I want to mm -hmm. know every time I'm going to put this <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. I think you got it. I think you got it down. <laughs> So let's talk a little bit about uh, travel life. So how do you balance uh, work, your side business and traveling? Mm -hmm. For me, I'm really into productivity, right? And so for me, it's always being sure I can maximize the amount of productivity and the amount of energy I have throughout the day, because I know some days I'm going to have more than others. And the traveling can be really exhausting. So travel days, I don't put anything on my calendar because I know whether I'm traveling three hours or 12 hours, I'm going to be tired and I'm not going to be able to do much. <laughs> and so it's really just looking at my calendar and figuring out what are going to be my best work days, what are going to be my rest days, and then what days am I going to, you know, go out and actually like explore the city. So it's kind of looking at it from a macro level and then from a micro level. I use different online tools. So my favorite is Trello for my like task mm -hmm. list. That's where I keep all of my to-do list. So I have my today. This is what I'm going to get done today. I have my week sort of lined out and then I kind of have my monthly and then my quarterly goals as well. So I actually usually start big. I go, okay, what are my yearly goals, quarterly, monthly? And then I kind of break them down into smaller ones to make sure that I'm still achieving the things I need to achieve. Obviously my day job, my full-time job with Hacker Paradise is very reactive in a lot of ways, right? Like I wake up, I'm like, it's going to be a great day. And then someone's like, my washing machine broke or <laughs> my hot water went out or something like that. And I'm like, oh, okay, I have to do this first. So my schedule does get interrupted quite a bit. It's not always perfect, but I really try to batch my task like tasks, especially when it comes to doing say, video work, right? So like yesterday I had to get a lot of filming done for Prague. So I built in like a two hour block and I just busted out a lot of stuff because I'm in that mindset and I'm in that mode. And then I can switch to doing something else later. So for me, keeping my task list up to date, combining business and life things in my task list, um, and then also bashing my task as much as I possibly can. And then the third one, which I think is hard for everybody, is just trying to be realistic about what I can actually fit in in a day and how much energy I'm going to have yes. and making sure that I'm achieving my goals, but I'm not costing myself social time or sleep or healthy lifestyle things, right? Like making sure that those things don't overtake my life, even though they are very important to me. Speaking of, of health things, um, how do you stay healthy mentally, physically with, well, with the long-term travel? I think traveling slow really helps. I think mm -hmm. the one, the people who get burned out quickly are the ones who move constantly mm -hmm. and who maybe jump from like country to country instead of being like, okay, I'm going to go to say Lisbon and then I'm going to go to Porto, right? That's a much easier distance to travel than say Portugal to you know, Buenos Aires or something like that. Right. Obviously you have to take those long trips every once in a while, but if you can mm -hmm. really combine sort of regions, that mm -hmm. will be really good. Also, because time zones can also be really tough. And then for me also, because of my job, I do a lot of group activities. And so it's really important to me to make sure I take those times alone and away from the group. So I'm actually an introvert. Even though all the things I do would, would probably tell you otherwise. Yeah. I was going to say would have never known. Yeah. 
and so like last night for example was my night in it was the monday night i was like i did have a call late but i was like i'm just gonna use that night to stay in and rest and i've also take weekend days and i stay in and i rest and so yeah i think it's making sure you can do that there's always gyms where we go so physically i can always stay in shape or during COVID, i got really good at doing like at home workouts so that's something i've added to my repertoire which is nice and then i think the hardest part is eating and staying like healthy that that way yeah. because it just really depends on where you go right? right like what are your options that are available um and czech republic it's a lot of bread and beer and that's what they love here and I love it too. So it's hard to make the, <laughs> the healthy choice sometimes. But I think we actually had this discussion. So in our groups, we do what's called a DMC, Deep Meaningful Conversations. Mm -hmm. And our topic last week was actually how do you balance work with social life, with sleep, with like eating healthy and doing all the things. And really at the end of the day, our answer was it's not possible. Like it's not possible to be perfect at all of them right. all the time. Mm -hmm. It's a lot about rotating priorities and rotating what is important to you at that time. So maybe your intention for a month in Thailand is to rest. And so you rest and whatever that means to you, whether that includes meditation or maybe working out is what gives you rest or whatever it is that's what you focus on. And then other times your focus is, okay, I have a project and I really want to get this project done. So I'm going to go to a place that's the most productive and that's what I'm going to do for a month. Right. And so I don't think it's actually possible to be perfect all the time. So I don't try to be, and I just let it go, but it's a lot about just figuring out your priorities in the moment. That's probably one of the biggest things I've learned during traveling is rotating priorities and that mm -hmm. you can't, not, not everything can be at the top all the time. It's, mm -hmm. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about safety. Is safety a concern? Mm -hmm. You know, how do you kind of manage that moving around, you know, location to location? It's not a huge concern for me. I don't know if I'm just a really trusting person or mm -hmm. I just like, I don't know what it is, but I definitely don't think about it. I think as much as other people, mm -hmm. it is, it is something I do think about. I'm not saying that I'm, you know, not aware. I think that's the main thing though. I'm always just very aware of my surroundings. So when I do travel, I don't arrive super late at night. That is one of my mm -hmm. safety things that I do. I yes. won't arrive past like nine, nine thirty PM, especially if it's in a place where I've never been and mm -hmm. I don't speak the language, which is pretty often. And so I don't do super late arrivals. That's one of my safety things. And then I typically tend to explore more during the day and see what feeling I get and kind of get to see what areas I feel like are safe or not safe. And then I also watch locals. So how do locals move around? Do they take taxis or Ubers late at night always? Like, do you see people walking around? How do they take care of their belongings? They're really going to be your best indicator of how dangerous a destination is mm -hmm. or like your neighborhood. Yeah. And then I'm just super aware of my surroundings. And so I don't, you know, walk down a dark alleyway. Mm -hmm. I stick to like the main street where there's actually people walking around and things like that. So I do make good decisions while I'm traveling. Things definitely happen, but at the same time, I find that the world is not as scary as we make it out to be, or we make it out to be in our head. From my experience, most people are usually pretty willing to help if something's wrong more than they are going to take advantage of you. And so I do go through with this mindset of I'm strong. I am capable. I can figure this out. Oh, that seems weird. Let me walk this other direction. Right? <laughs> like, I think, yeah, it's just awareness. And if you're scared of the world around you, you're going to attract things that are scary but if you kind of go through it with more of a positive mindset, what I found is that the things around me are, are not as scary as we think. All right. Let's hear some travel experiences you've had. So uh, what's been your funniest travel moment? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know if it's funny to other people, but when we were in Kenya, so it was outdoor showers and my little hut was sort of right by the fence. And every time I would take a shower, the monkeys would know that the water was on. And so they would come and just line up around in the trees around me and just watch me take a shower. <laughs> just like maybe more surreal than anything. And you're just like, 
hey monkey like even though you know it's a monkey it's still weird having eyeballs on you yeah. like, <laughs> while you're showering <laughs> they're just waiting for me to be done and they can come drink the water out of the out of the shower head but yeah that that was kind of funny actually just came part of my daily life (laughs) Uh, what's been your most adventurous location I think for me Kenya was most adventurous in the sense that it was just something so different than anything I'd ever done Mm -hmm. and it wasn't as maybe developed as other places I've been But as far as like adventure activities that I can do and like being in nature, I would say either New Zealand or Cape Town, where I just did a lot of like different activities, especially that kind of stretched me a little bit. What's been your absolute favorite location? Cape Town, hands down. (laughs) Like I've thought about it every day since I left. Like I cannot wait to go back. (laughs) Yeah. I love it so much. That's awesome. Any troublesome moments? Yeah. So I've had a few troublesome moments, but the one that first comes to mind is I decided to take a bus from Budapest to Lyon, France for a house that I got last minute and the bus fare or the train fares were just too expensive at the time. So I took this like 12 hour bus and I had one transfer and I knew how to transfer. It wasn't a big deal. And it was in, mm, I forget exactly what country I was in at the time. What I didn't realize was that the bus was going to drop us off at like three or four in the morning at this bus stop. And then I had to wait like three hours for my next bus. And when I say a bus stop, I mean an outdoor on the side of the road bus stop, not like a bus station. Right. And so (laughs) I was like, okay, okay. There was like one or two other people with me. So I wasn't completely alone. And there was a train station nearby that I did walk over to, but it was, you know, it was the middle of the night. So it was like completely dead. So I just walked back to the bus stop because it felt safer actually. And Mm -hmm. so we're hanging out, we're hanging out, more people are showing up and I'm like, okay. Cause there was a lot of buses that came in like five, six in the morning to pick people up again, to keep going. Well, there was five of us trying to get on this bus to France and our bus just never came. And I didn't speak any German, but they did. And so they were asking drivers, is this their bus? Is this their bus? Everybody said no. And I was like, okay. And we were all just kind of like huddled together. So 7 a.m. rolls around. Our bus hasn't arrived. And we finally get in touch with support. And they're like, no, your bus came and left. We're like, "Mm, we're not, we don't think that it did. We think that it scared stuff. They're like, no, it definitely came. You guys missed it. So still to this day, I don't know if it came and went and we just didn't get on it or if it never showed up. But at this point, we all had to get to Lyon. We were just like, what, what do we do? There's no other buses coming. And of course we've been on the side of the road for like three or four hours and we're so tired. And so anyways, I go to the train station and the lady was just so nice and so friendly. She's like, okay, here's the train. It leaves in an hour, da, 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 you know, it gives us the whole thing. And then I ended up having a really great train ride with these two other girls who also missed mm-hmm. the bus on our way to France. And it was much nicer than taking the bus anyway. But yeah, for those few hours, you're just like, what did I just do? (laughs) (laughs) Why am I standing on the side of the road with my suitcase by myself at four in the morning? (laughs) Like, Um, so yeah, so sometimes travel just throws you curveballs. And what I found is it's best to just stay calm. Think about this. Don't worry about what happened in the moment, right? Just like, what are the solutions that I can do? And in that case, luckily there was a train station nearby. Oh man, I had anxiety just just listening to that. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes, even out of those troublesome moments, like something amazing happens too. You know. Mm-hmm. So. Mm-hmm. Any other animal encounters that you had besides the monkeys? <laughs> Besides the monkeys, those were pretty good ones. Those were, those were. <laughs> I mean, who knew I would live with monkeys for a month? Hiking in Idaho, I've like run into moose. I also spent a summer working in Yosemite when I was in college. Oh. And so there were definitely some like bear encounters. Oh, wow. Yeah. I mean, I love animals. Obviously, I <laughs> stay away from the big, scary animals, I view them from a distance. But yeah, I always find it to be really fun. And then we also went on a safari when we were in Kenya. So that was, I mean, that was a bucket list, just being able to see elephants and giraffes and lions like in their, 
in their homes. That was really special. Uh, what location has had the best food? I'm going to say New Zealand. I just, they have a really big, um, like brunch culture, like Ooh, breakfast brunch. That and that's just my favorite. And you can get yes. it until like 4 PM oh. and, and the food there is just, it's so good and it's so fresh and I really, really loved the food in New Zealand. Well, I think New Zealand is moving up on my list then. <laughs> Brunch is my favorite. Yeah. What has been the best uh, historical destination that you've been to? Mm. So Prague is getting up there on the list. I really, really love Prague. And I, I didn't know it had as much history as it has. It was like the center of Europe for a really long time. But I think Berlin was probably the first place I went with a lot of history that just fascinated me. And I just loved learning about everything when I was in Berlin. Any other uh, travel experiences you would like to share? Um, There was one time I was house sitting in Vietnam and there's a lot of the houses don't have yards there. And so I just had to go walk the dogs like a couple times a day. My very first dog walk when the homeowners are literally in the air on an airplane. (laughs) So there's no way to get help. Um, I locked myself out of the house. Oh my God. And I didn't realize it until we got back for the walk. Oh yeah. That was a fun one. By some sort of miracle, their neighbors across the street were actually American. And I didn't even know that they didn't tell me about them. Um, and they came home from dinner, like 15 minutes after I was just like standing outside, figuring out what to do. And they were like, are you okay? Do you need help? I'm like, (laughs) yeah, I do. (laughs) (laughs) And so, you know, like two hours later, this is a Sunday night too, right? So like in a lot of places around the world, like no business is done on Sunday, especially at night. So like we contacted the landlord. He did not want to come help me, um, but he did eventually. And then he got the whole like neighborhood in on this situation, trying to get this door unlocked. Oh my God. Uh, because what actually would happen, it wasn't just locked. They had a security lock or whatever that goes into oh. the ground, right? Like it's on the door and you push it down into the ground, into the okay. concrete. So that had fallen. Oh. So what's that actually like a door lock? It had fallen into the ground. There was no way to get this door open. Oh my. Yeah. So that was like a two hour experience. That was my very first night walking the dogs. Wow. In men. <laughs> I do. I don't have anything like crazy or tragic. I really, I've found that there's, again, anytime I'm in a situation, something happens and I don't know what to do. There's always someone there to help me and help me figure it out. So I don't know if I've just been really fortunate or again, things just aren't as scary as they seem. Yeah. No, I've had the same experience. I've had a couple things and, and there's always somebody there that that's willing to help. That That's so mm-hmm. true. Like, can you share your number one travel hack? I'm going to share two. Okay. Um, the first one is packing cubes, mm-hmm. packing cubes all the way. Just use them when you're packing. It mm-hmm. saves you so much space and it helps you organize. My second one is when it comes to ATMs, because I think a lot of people don't know this. But when you are in a foreign country and you're at the ATM, there's two things that you can do to help actually. One is don't, when the screen comes up, it asks you how much money you you want. It usually gives you like prompts, right? You want $100, $200, whatever. Depending on the currency, it could be 100,000. Usually if you can put in your own number, it's still divisible by whatever they ask you to be. So instead of say 100, you do um, 150 or, you know, for example then that'll help you get smaller bills because a lot of times these machines are just going to give you the biggest bills that they have. And then they can be really hard to break because businesses Mm -hmm. don't want to take them. So that's Mm -hmm. just one tip when you go to the ATM. Um, And then the second tip at the ATM is as you go through that stage, it'll ask you if you accept their conversion rate, always hit decline because Mm -hmm. your bank will typically give you a better conversion rate than that local ATM. So if you hit decline, then you can still move on to the next, the next page. You still have to accept the fee that they're going to charge you, but you don't have to accept the conversion rate. Yeah, that's a good, that's a very good one. 
And, and a lot of times it, I think it, uh, I was in Portugal when I noticed that it was asking me the conversion or to, to accept the conversion rate. Mm-hmm. And I actually had assumed it was asking me something else. Like, um, if I, if, I don't know, did it confirm the amount or something? And I actually hit, I hit yes the first time. It wasn't until the second time I realized, okay, they're asking me the conversion rate and I need to not Mm -hmm. do that. (laughs) That's a very good one. And there's Um, also, a lot of people don't know about this either, but there's actually like a banking alliance, like a worldwide banking alliance. And mm -hmm. there really aren't that many banks that are part of it, to be honest, but I have Bank of America. And so um, I usually look up if there's a, Alliance Bank in the country I'm in. And if you go use the ATM at that bank, then you don't get charged that Mm -hmm. extra fee. So that's another thing just to consider, like, look at your bank, like, and some of them um, don't charge fees at all, like ATM fees at all. So like, there are actually a lot of different options out there if you just Mm -hmm. do a little bit of research. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for being on the podcast. It's been super fun to chat with you. Um, If any of our listeners want to find you on social media, where would they go? My website, Instagram, and YouTube are all Traveling Taylor. It's Traveling with one L and Taylor with an E-R. And then you can also find me on LinkedIn at Taylor Gill. Again, thank you so much for being on. It's been super fun and we'll talk to you next time. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda. And you know what time it is. It's time for a promotion of social media for Golden Shovel on Facebook. Please like us at Shovel Toss. Twitter, follow us at Gold Shovel. LinkedIn, follow Golden Shovel. And please subscribe to our YouTube channel at Golden Shovel Agency. As far as Golden Shovel news goes, we recently hired a new gatekeeper representative, Audra Shanneman, who works out of New Ulm, Minnesota, recently joined the team. Um, is taking over accounts right away. Some of you um, listening to this may have already met her or some of you will meet her very soon. So very excited uh, to have her on the Gatekeeper team and a member of the Golden Shovel team. We will be back very soon with another episode of Shovel Talk. Talk to you then.